morning, everybody. Uh, my name's Mike Coffey. Uh, I'm going to speak a little about, uh, about what myself and Robin have done over the years. As Jeff said, much of it is un, un, uh, unpublishable. Uh, we've behaved disgracefully many occasions, uh, and I hope we continue to behave disgracefully as we get older and older. Um, the good thing about uh, getting old yourself is you get to work with old people like uh, Robin and uh, Ryan here. Um, <coughs> and uh, I'm going to talk a little bit about what me and Robin have uh, been up to over the years, but I'm going to concentrate on, on one thing uh, specifically. Now, as, uh, as Jeff pointed out, uh, we um, undertake genetic evaluations here in Edinburgh as a result of uh, the evaluations being put out to tender many years ago. Um, and when I first came to Edinburgh, uh, I came to work to look after the, the Langhill herd, uh, and Jeff said, well, we've, uh, we've got a, a postdoc called Hadger uh, and a supervisor called Robin. You can work with them. Uh, and so that was my kind of induction. And uh, I sat through many meetings where Hadger, who didn't speak very quickly, would think for five minutes about the question that Robin had asked, and then Robin would think for five minutes about the answer that Hadger gave. And myself and Jeff sat there twiddling our thumbs, wondering what to do with the, the very difficult silence that ensued. But eventually an answer would come and uh, the world moved on. It was a good project and that was my induction into working with Robin. Uh, and over time we did a bit more and a bit more and then, as Jeff mentioned, the, the genetic evaluation uh, contract came up for tender and we organised ourselves in Edinburgh, we put together a bid. Um, it was quite interesting actually because it, it was quite a big, well, quite big, it was a very big team effort and everybody put, uh, put stuff in. Uh, and I was away at, at the final stages uh, and I think Eileen and Sue put together the final uh, contract bid. Uh, and, in, and again, it was in those old days that Jeff mentioned about things like phones and stuff. That, that you actually had to deliver the paper tender to the offices. Uh, and so right at the last minute, we got the tender together, sent it off to SAC main building uh, to be couriered down to London uh, to be handed over uh, as our bid, only to find that SAC hadn't paid the courier company and they refused to take it. Uh, so there was a last minute scrabble around as, as we all ditched in a fiver or something, and ultimately, we found somebody who would take this thing down to London. Uh, we won the contract um, and were invited, as it were, to go to give a presentation. And, uh, and the, those giving that presentation were myself, Sue Brotherstone, and Robin Thompson. And we went down and gave the presentation. That was a fun day, I have to say. I can't tell you much about it because it was fun. Uh, but it was a really fun day. Uh, we won the contract uh, and now we do the genetic evaluations. Uh, obviously, early days, it was just simply mimicking what was already done. But very soon, we got in the swing of things, uh, and we now do evaluations for dairy, beef, sheep. We've done some work on fish, and we do work on goats, uh, and we now do a little bit of work on pigs. So we've expanded quite rapidly. Uh, we do a, a number of things like uh, database and web design and so on to, to help people understand, to improve the uptake of the evaluations and so on. And it's a very fast-moving environment, um, and uh, obviously with genomics coming on stream, it's moving ever quicker. Um, the indexes that, uh, interestingly, Brian showed PIN and Pedigree Index, that were the old indexes that were simply production only. And over time, that's this one here, over time we've added things in. We've added in lifespan, uh, predicted from type, and then lifespan included daughter records, then somatic cell count and locomotion, uh, fertility, and this is the one I'm going to come back to in a little while. Uh, and then we've kind of grown it by adding actually lameness measures and, and fertility measures in. And this is very typical of most national evaluations worldwide where uh, over time new traits are added, uh, the breeding uh, goal becomes broader, uh, a wider range of traits selected for at the same time and the animals become, as it were, more profitable. And you can see that this has accelerated now over the last few years and uh, we've been added in things like efficiency, a kind of a maintenance measure uh, and carving ease. Uh, and then more recently we've added in uh, carcass traits 
generated from abattoir data and this one here TB advantage and again we are the world's first and currently only country in the world that publish a TB resistance EBV uh, and it's getting a lot of thanks to, to work from John and the other Ed Edinburgh colleagues um, that took some doing I have to say you wouldn't realize the uh, the political uh, issues associated with getting TB data from the government so that we can produce a breeding value um, and we now select animals accordingly. Interestingly, uh, AHDB in the last few weeks have won uh, a contract, a, a bid, they put in a bid and got £300,000 to genotype 10,000 cows in the TB area, which is essentially the south of, you know, you draw a line across Manchester, everything in the south has got TB, everything above is free of TB apart from the animals that move from the south to the north. Um, and, and that's going to help us uh, make a big inroads into the improvement in TB. Um, and again, very, very recently, we added in calf survival. And I'll just raise that one as, a, as an example of the way things are moving so quickly um, that that took three weeks to produce. We had the idea, we got the data, produced the parameters, produced the index, and three weeks later, we had a national index for calf survival and we published it in the next routine run. So the world of evaluations is moving very, very, very fast. Um, now, where, where is it going? Well, obviously, this is the position we're in at the moment. And we're now starting to look at, at the use of mid-infrared spectral data to predict a, a range of new phenotypes that we're interested in. Uh, and I'm going to uh, sort of dwell on some of those in relation to pregnancy and fertility. But this is a good source of what I like to call phrenotypes. You can use that one yourself, if you like, in future. Phrenotypes. Because essentially, uh, the mid-infrared data comes for free. It, it happens anyway, and so the more phenotypes you can predict from it, uh, the incremental cost is, is very, very, um, very low. So how do, we, how do we do evaluations? Well, we receive... That's a bit difficult to see from here. We receive and process almost all of the UK national um, animal data, and that amounts now to tens of millions of animal records, hundreds of millions of performance records, and tens of billions of spectral data points. So we, we really are in the um, big data. I call it the really big data, the, the actual big data. Um, and we spend a lot of time messing about with data. Uh, so we actually only do the clever stuff of a really small amount of our time. I think 90% of our time is spent fiddling around with data and getting it ready, prepared for genetic evaluations. Now, for those, those of you that will be looking at me and saying, but surely after 12 years of doing evaluation, you've got systems that do this automatically. You don't have to touch it from one run to the next. Well, I can tell you, having done it, I don't know any, any hundreds of times we've done it, every single run, we get a piece of data that we've never experienced before. Somebody does something with some data in a different format, they change something, they delete some records or they add some records in, uh, and so we then spend a great deal of time trying to salvage the situation. And we use a, a whole range of uh, a relatively modern tools. But for those of you, given that we're talking here about the old days, you'll be pleased to know that we still use extensively Fortran. And in fact, we're starting to use more and more Fortran uh, recently uh, because of the speed it has uh, and the, the computational power required to process billions of spectral points. Uh, what do we produce? Well, we produce genetic and genomic evaluations. We do a full run three times a year where we recalculate the SNP key uh, and the haplotype library. Uh, we've currently got about uh, 200,000 genotypes that constitute this haplotype library. And then we run monthly with intermediate runs uh, where we just use the existing SNP key to make the monthly predictions. And when you add it all together with all the different traits and all the different breeds, and the EBVs and the GBVs, we do over 140 separate trait breed combination runs every single month. Um, and there's discussion now at the moment about moving that to weekly. Um, and of course, you know, 140 a week is quite something. Uh, and the number of traits and the trait combinations we're doing is increasing. So again, putting into context the work that, uh, that um, Robin and others has done over the years is, is being deployed 
in, in a great number of uh, times. Now, I'm going to go back now to a specific project that um, actually John Williams was responsible for this, this project, which is uh, the Fertility Index. It's a good example of uh, uh, evaluations in work. And it's the first time that national fertility data was made available. We actually had to negotiate with the milk recording organisations to get the data so that we could produce fertility indices. And it was with Nottingham, and we had a meeting at Nottingham, and that meeting was to discuss a motion from one of the breeding companies that were participant in that project who wanted to stop the project because they felt farmers would be confused by a fertility index. They felt that farmers were not really clever enough to be able to incorporate lots of information in their breeding programs, and so they wanted to stop the project. Well, fortunately, we saw them off, uh, and, and the rest is history. Now, the, the way that we um, calculate it, we use a hexavariate model where we evaluate six traits altogether. We chuck four of them away, and then we publish NR56 and carving interval. And my recollection of this, bearing in mind that despite my youthful appearance, I'm actually quite old as well, uh, my recollection was that we had a real problem trying to get a reliability calculation. Uh, and uh, Robin worked it out, actually. And like uh, Brian showed, he, it was a piece of newspaper, where well, Robin gave it to me on an envelope. It, it actually was the back of an envelope that he gave me that. Unfortunately, I've chucked it away and I haven't got it, so I can't actually show it to you. But that reliability calculation is still used today. And for those of you that are interested, there it is. I had a look, look at it last night. I couldn't work out quite what it's doing and why, but that's what we actually use to calculate the reliability of the fertility index. So I'll leave it up there for a second for all you uh, equation geeks. You can think what's going on. I, I have no idea, but we've programmed it, and there you go. I'll give you a second. Three, two, one. We're off. So um, now what's been the, what's been the impact uh, of this fertility index? What's been the impact of us being able to get national data and produce genetic indexes that farmers can use. Well, as you can see, the, the, the blue line is, is milk kilograms, and the red line here is calving interval. So going up, calving interval going up is bad. Now, this is, as you'd expect, as we now know, looking back, that if you select for milk yield alone and don't select for the traits it's correlated with, they will follow it. And there's a very strong correlation between uh, longer calving interval a milk yield, as you can see, tracking it perfectly. And we introduced the fertility index here. And you can see now that milk yield is rising still and calving interval is falling. So it's a kind of a, a really good, powerful demonstration that if you get an index right, uh, that you can actually change highly correlated traits in the opposite direction um, and, and do it. So... This has been obviously relatively recently, in, in the last uh, decade or so, that we've managed to do this. Um, and, but if you, if you plot the index out over a long period of time, you can see that it's, it's been dropping for many years. This is going back to 1990. You can see that for, for all the 90s and the 2000s, the selection policy for dairy cows was leading to poorer fertility, uh, and, and quite drastically. <coughs> And actually, in fact, what led to the DEFRA-funded work at Nottingham was to try to resolve this problem here, which was costing the industry an absolute fortune. And you can see it's, it's now turned around, and, and these lines here are, are the components of fertility, and then the fertility index, which is these components multiplied by their relative economic values. So these, this figure here is the actual value of um, the the mean value of the national fertility situation. So you can see it's dropping quite dramatically um, for a period of time, going to about zero and then rising again in the recent years. So my next slide actually concentrates on this little area here because we don't really want to worry and, and concern ourselves about the bad things. Let's look at the good things on a scale that make them look even gooder. Um, and so what we've got here is fertility index converted to a value, rising uh, dramatically and carrying on uh, doing so since about 2008. So what I've done is, is picked out the numbers uh, that that relates to, and here they are. Uh, so the, the average fertility index of the national cow population for each of those years multiplied by their 
economic value and multiplied by 1.9 million cows. It's a crude estimate, I give you that. It wouldn't have been 1.9 million cows every year, but they're roughly, actually there probably would have been more there than there are here. Uh, but it, it, it equates to a, a cumulative value of about 116 pound. And just to be scientific, I've discounted it using net present value, because I knew Tim Burns would be in the audience. Uh, and it comes to about 104 million pounds. Now, whether I've got it right, wrong, or, or, or not, or how right or wrong it is, how close it is, is not really material. It just shows you uh, that selection for something that's highly valuable can yield immense benefits for the industry. And in just a 10-year period, we've made 104 million pounds or so just by improving fertility. Um, and so for you, Robin, you can claim a share of that. I don't know what share, but feel free to claim all or some or, or a proportion. Now you can see that the indexes are used uh, widely and routinely. This is a page from a, a, a bull catalogue uh, where farmers can see UK produced values on international bulls uh, routinely. And this information is also available on uh, websites, on the uh, Dairy Co website and so on. So the information from eGenes gets out very, very quickly to a wide range uh, of people. Now, I couldn't, uh, this has got nothing to do with my talk, but I just love showing this slide. Um, but it, it does have a little bit, actually, because we're moving on now. We, we, we're talking about uh, improvements in fertility, and I mentioned earlier on about the use of mid-infrared spectral data, which is this here. Uh, it's produced as a result of routine milk recording, and for the last few years, uh, Eileen and her team have been looking at predicting other things from it. And I know other groups around the world, in, in Ireland and in Holland and Belgium, are doing the same kind of thing. What can we produce in addition to? And that work's going on. But recently, we've been looking at using uh, mere predicted phenotypes or mere data itself. And we've moved now to machine learning. Um, and this is an excerpt from a, a presentation that was given to the TAG recently. Um, and machine learning is looking basically at taking, this, in this case it was spectral data, running it through a model and dividing it into categories. And in this case, in the, this example, uh, it's pregnancy. So we're looking to determine whether we can predict pregnancy uh, from spectral data. Uh, there's supervised and unsupervised, and I, for the life of me, can't remember what the explanation for this is, so I'll just casually move over it onto the next slide. Um, in this work that, uh, that was done by Werner Brand in, in eGenes, we use national spectral data, so we've got three million animals worth of spectral records, uh, and they have 1,060 points each, um, and then... <coughs> that those were subdivided equally between pregnant and non-pregnant animals. So we know the pregnancy status of these animals. And we know the true pregnancy status because we use the following calving interval and go back 282 days to ensure that the animal is pregnant during the period that we're analysing the data. We use Langhill cow data to do the validation uh, and we used a subset of the spectral points, 212, and then we added 13 more surrounding it to, to make it up to 250, uh, 225. And that, you have to have an even number for the way it blocks things. Okay, that was just a sort of a, uh, a convenience thing. Uh, and then we do the training. So we offer the model 225 spectral points and two labels, pregnant, not pregnant. And it gives you back a kind of a probability number that... that that the animal is in state zero or state one, and they look like that. Uh, because of um, memory, we had to split it into three lots of a million records, 80% for data for training and 20% for validation. And the way it works internally is it keeps splitting the data, and iterating round, uh, revising its prediction based on the answers to the previous iteration. Um, so having done that, we use 3 million national records uh, to produce a prediction equation. We then predicted Langhill cow records with it. Um, and we found that we can predict the onset of pregnancy from milk spectral alone with an accuracy of nearly 83%. Um, and if you think about that, that then gives us uh, national records for fertility that could go into a fertility index uh, and improve the index that we've, we've already got. 
One of the interesting things is that we can also predict loss of pregnancy with an accuracy of about 73%. So one of the biggest losses that farmers have is that once a cow is pregnant, when they lose that pregnancy, it can be many months before the farmer is alerted to the fact that she's no longer pregnant. And that is very expensive for a farmer to deal with. And the, the milk recording company that we're working with are very interested in this, more so than predicting pregnancy. Uh, and this is the bit that we can predict here. We can predict from milk spectra when the cow is in that state. Um, and we can also predict this is a pregnancy and this is the loss. We can predict this state here. So these are very valuable things that have been developed onwards after the initial work on fertility. And the reason, I was trying to think of a sort of a way of joining all this together and to make it into a Robin-centric kind of argument here, uh, which is, you know, obviously Robin is a classic statistician where you start off with your model, you, and you, you model the data, and then you refine the model, and you validate your answers. Well, in, in terms of machine learning, you don't really have any idea of what you're doing. You ask the software to find an answer, and then you validate the answer. And I wonder what the consequences of us moving into this kind of area are. You know, will we, will we lose the capability of, of doing uh, basic statistics in our desire to find answers? Because you can find answers very, very quickly without really understanding uh, how you got those answers. So the conclusions uh, I've come to uh, after having done this is that quantitative genetics has worked very well over the years. And as I get older, I start thinking about being wary of throwing old stuff away. Uh, of course, apart from British cars from the 1970s that were really rubbish and deserved to be thrown away. But where, where should the future effort be expended? You know, we're, we're now sort of a relatively mature state for, for e-genes. Where do we go next? Do we chase down genes? Do we, we spend our time trying to increase the number of genotypes we have in the data? Or both, in what proportion? How can our past experience be used to shape the future deliverables that we do? What's the role of gene jockeys in the future? Is phenotype is king true? I think probably more importantly, who is the next Robin Thompson and where does he live? That's what I'm interested in. Thanks very much.